and welcome to The Royal Beat, the show that brings you the biggest royal stories from around the world. And coming up on this week's show, with King Charles's coronation date now confirmed, we're going to be taking a look at some of the details revealed by Buckingham Palace and discuss the difficult decisions that he and Queen Consort Camilla still have to make. Plus, with other royals well and truly back to work, we're going to be taking a look at what they've been up to, from the Wales's radio takeover on World Mental Health Day to Sophie Wessex in the Democratic Republic of Congo. They have been very busy. And we check in on uh, news coming out of the royal household of Denmark, where the Queen is struggling to heal a rift between her two sons. Does this sound slightly familiar territory? OK, and to guide us through this and much more, I've got a real A-list lineup today. The Sun's royal photographer, Arthur Edwards, is with us. Daily Mirror's royal editor, Russell Myers, and the Sunday Times royal editor, Roy Anika. Lovely to see you all. How are you? Very Good. well. Excellent. Wow. Now, you. Arthur, before we proceed, I was uh, lucky enough to be invited down to RAF North Holt last week and was working with a senior service woman there who um, shared with me a moment that she'd observed between yourself and King Charles in the days following his mother's death. And she said the moment that, that the, the king saw you, in a professional capacity, um, she said there was a prickle of emotion from him, a genuine affection to see, uh, there he is, you know, Arthur Edwards. Yeah, well, I was um, obviously photographing him like crazy because it was such a small situation. He's just going to shake hands with the base commander and then This was him flying back from? From, from Edinburgh. Um, and, um, of course, I was, was photographing the king for the first time. It's his first thing, thing I'm doing it. And, I'm, and then he came up to me and he just sort of said, are you OK? I said, yeah, I'm fine. I said, I'm so sorry about the loss of your mother. And he said, um, he said, well, it was inevitable, he said, it had to happen someday. And then he just pat me on the arm and got in the car. And uh, I was just gobsmacked, you know, because, I mean, I, I thought he'd have so much on his mind. And yet, I suppose he sort of saw me. And he knew that I'd been photographing the Queen for over 40 years. And he probably felt I had a bit of uh, feeling. And I did, of course, obviously, we all did. We all have covered this beat. We know the grief he was going through. And, um, and yet he was coping with it so brilliantly. And, um, and he made that wonderful speech to the nation, and I think everybody now is behind him. Absolutely. Well, and a date has been set. Uh, King Charles's coronation has been confirmed to be taking place on the 6th of May 2023. And more details have been released by Buckingham Palace, including the fact that it's going to take place uh, in Westminster Abbey and that Camilla will be crowned as Queen Consort alongside His Majesty. So uh, we also know something else to be true for that occasion. Uh, it will be a very different kind of occasion from his mother's. Um, before we discuss why and what uh, King Charles's coronation might look like. So how will the king go about balancing the needs of the present day with the symbols of continuity that are crucial to any monarch? What do we know so far about the differences between the two ceremonies, Russ? Well, they're definitely going to be uh, a bit of a slimmed down version. We talk a lot about slimmed down monarchy that uh, to Charles has, um, has long lauded and this needs to be fitting for, for a modern occasion, for a modern monarchy. I don't think we're, we're certainly not going to see a sort of three hour ceremony. No. Um, it's one hour, isn't it? We've been talking. Yeah, just over an hour, I would say. There's going to be a lot less people there. I think there's 8,000 people there at the, the late Queen's coronation. It's talking about around about 2,000, which was a similar number to, to attended the funeral at Westminster Abbey. Um, uh, and then you, you look at some of the, 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 the intricacies of the ceremony, and I don't think that um, we will see as much sort of uh, pomp and pageantry. You'll still have an element of the traditional aspects of it, but... The golden carriage will be in play, won't We will it? see that, and that was, you know, refurbished at a great expense for the for the um, the, the platinum jubilee, mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. And Golden. so, the, the the problem is, um, well, no, it's not necessarily a problem. I think that the king is acutely aware of the fact that you know, not only people in Britain but across the world, there's a cost of living crisis going on. People have got an awful lot on their plate, and. Um, and he said himself that he, that, that he needs to evolve, his role needs to evolve and certainly the, the role of the monarchy needs to evolve. But, um, but we do things well like this. There's been a you know, huge outpouring of uh, emotion um, at, the, at the funeral. And you look at the, the way we celebrated the Platinum Jubilee and, and I'm sure this will be a, another big spectacle. Interesting, isn't it? The Duke of Norfolk was responsible uh, for, the, for overseeing the, the state funeral uh, of, of the of the, the late Queen, and here he is in charge again of the coronation. This is a man that has a lot of responsibility to carry around, doesn't he? Um, 
Do you think that we're going to see uh, as many outfit changes, Roya? I know it sounds like a ridiculous thing to ask, but <laughs> these, these all represent something. I mean, we're not talking about J-Lo here. Uh, we're talking about some of these robes that really have been entrenched in tradition and meaning. I, do you know what? I, 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 there's been a lot of chat about what dress everyone's going to be in for the coronation and the, perhaps all the, you know, the peers of the realm that, that are there and all the dignitaries might not be in all the ceremonial robes, people might be in suits. But I think when it comes to King Charles, I, there's something about the sort of transition from... Um, you know the, the the dress that the Queen was wearing, and then she put on that very simple white robe, and then she had the golden, you know, the golden robe put on her. I think some of those elements will be retained um, because they're sort of symbolic of, you know, the, the, they're the ritual of showing, you know, the, the, the very simple and, and King Charles taking, you know, taking the oath, being anointed. But I think. I don't think it'll be, there won't, there won't be as much. It's not going to be that it isn't going to be a three hour service. So I think, you know, King Charles will think much more carefully about what dress or uniform he wears and then, you know, how many changes there are. I think it'll be less than the Queen's. But, you know, for all this price, for all this talk of a, you know, cut price coronation, I, you know, King Charles understands that people like to see some mm. of the grandeur. And I think the coronation day in May next year. I think you will have a, all that sort of great ceremonial style around it that we saw for, for the funeral, perhaps not on the scale of the funeral, but I think you will see, you know, the household cavalry, you will see a very strong military element. It, it will still feel grand. Mm. It's the crowning of the king it's yeah, it and a queen. Yeah. It's a very yeah, big moment. Definitely. I mean, some things won't change. Westminster Abbey, for a start, is obviously going to be um, where this takes place. And every English coronation has been held there uh, since that of William the Conqueror in 1066. That's right. That's how long the royal family's been going. Wow! And um, you know, like, like uh, Roy was saying, they will have tradition. They will have the, uh, the, the mounted soldiers carrying them, going alongside the uh, the state coach and uh, and Charles will give it a lot of tradition but you know I don't know where they got 8,000 people in there mm -hmm. for the coronation because I was there for the in there for the Queen's funeral and they had 2,000 that looked pretty busy then mm -hmm. they must have been sitting on each other's laps but <laughs> in, in when the Queen was crowned but um, this uh, this is uh, a big occasion for the country, huge, isn't it? and he's going to be our king. And I think we should give him a, a real great send off. I know the country's on its knees, but you know we can do better than mm. most it's interesting, people. Isn't it? The, the yeah. mood of the nation is something that was acutely on the Queen's mind when she was um, when she was crowned, because it was post-war Britain. People needed that sense of optimism and that that sense of hope in the air. How will he pitch it? Do you think? And how involved do you think William will be in working alongside him on this? Listen, I watched the Queen's coronation. I was 12. It went on forever. Um, but, you know, we were, it was a poor time for people then. You know, the war had not been over long. It was, food was still on ration. And yet they put on this great service, ceremony for the, for the nation. And, and I think the king will do the same. And it's not only for us here. The whole world will be watching this. And, and they'll put it, they'll show Britain at its best. So I don't think it might be only an hour, but I think it'd be an hour of splendor. Mm. These are the main players. This image was released, Arthur. I'd love your take on, on this I portrait. I love this picture. In fact, I've uh, I run Chris. It's a really super picture. It's, um, it just shows the future looks bright, you know, the future looks solid. I mean, we've got, obviously, King Charles and Queen Camilla now, uh, two of the nicest people ever you could want to work with, but following up is William and Catherine, and they are just tops. And they're just dedicated. And you know, Prince Charles's main role in life was to make William into a good king. And I think he's done a brilliant job so far. And I think, as I say, it's pretty safe now. And then we've got, of course, William's family coming along afterwards. So I think the royal family uh, is, is, is in a pretty good state. And, um, and, and I think William would do, support his father every way he possibly can. There's a lot of sim symbolism behind this photo, and particularly the timing of it. Yeah. The palace kept it back for uh, 10 days or so after the, the Queen's funeral, and it was released, you know, and there was, there was talk at the palace, it was released to sort of show, you know, the symbolism of unity and continuity from the King and his heir, mm. because that is what so much focuses on at the moment, you know, a smooth transition, we, we've seen that, but also looking to the future. And actually, it was really interesting, you showed the image just then of the Queen in resting the Prince of Wales. Um, at Carnarvon for his message, and we've already heard from William. I don't need a big investiture as the no. Prince of Wales. Yeah, it's not going to happen. We don't so. need that. Let's just focus on what it means to be Prince of Wales and sort of building that relationship. So, so, so we're we'll starting to see that how this kind of more modern approach yeah. is is presenting itself. Let's talk, as uh, Roya, if if you were about um, how Charles is hand King Charles is handling his relationship with government now that he's no longer the Prince of Wales, but the King uh, of, of England, King Charles the Third. Um, 
The government, our new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, uh, has apparently asked King Charles not to attend COP27, which is an event that he would, as Princess, Prince of Wales, be very keen to be at, right? Yeah, I mean, this was a big Sunday Times front page story a couple of weeks ago. And uh, when, I, when I heard about this, I was quite taken by surprise because there is precedent for monarchs to address cops. We saw the Queen last yeah. year. The Queen would have been at COP26 if it hadn't been for ill health. She gave a wonderful, totally non-political address yes. as, you know, pr the Prince of Wales and his family were there. Um, and the King had all sorts of engagements planned at COP27. And he acknowledged in that first national address the day after the Queen died his role had changed. He w would have a different approach to the causes he, he championed. So I think he, he was all set to acknowledge that and go and deliver a very non-political rallying cry to world leaders to say it's wonderful you're all here, you're all doing important work, I commend you, continue, you know, crack on. But he just double-checked with Liz Truss whether, you know, he, he could still go ahead and was advised best not. And Why I, do you think that is? I have to say, I think that's a, a, a missed opportunity. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, and a very strange decision by the Prime Minister. And, and you know, when <laughs> I went to the palace with that story... <laughs> she's, um, she's done a few of those. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, there was no pushback. They didn't try and deny it. You know, that I was... I was briefed on uh, advice had been sought and advice had been, you know, received and the king was no longer going. I mean, arguably, he is an incredibly safe he's, pair of hands in a situation like this, politically probably safer than she is right now. Well, I think w w whether you like King Charles or not, he is a world-recognised voice mm -hmm. on climate and the environment, which he's been banging the drum for 50 years. So he could have carried any government message with Huge quite a lot more kudos. So, uh, you know... It, to go back to your original question, how is how is he? We've got a new monarch and a new prime minister. They are both adjusting to their new roles and finding their feet in that relationship with each other. And well, that was quite a punchy call of hers. Mm. Well, let's take a look because yesterday he had an audience with the <laughs> prime minister. I don't know if you heard. Um, you have to really lean in and listen to the commentary as he welcomed her uh, yesterday. But remind me, will you, Roy? What? How did he greet her? Probably, probably not in the way she expected. So Liz Truss arrived for the weekly audience on Wednesday evening at Buckingham Palace, and he said, um, "Ah, you're 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 here again." <laughs> Dear, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Which I just thought was... And then camera, the camera stopped rolling, and I just thought that was um, superb. For, for people tuning in from around the world, I mean, we're in very tumultuous political times right now. This is a new prime minister who has made some extraordinary decisions alongside her chancellor. She's had a bumpy ride. And the country is, I think, it's safe to say, aghast, up in arms. And was he in that moment speaking for his people, do you think? I suspect he may have been speaking for your back. Dear, oh dear, you've had a tricky old time since I saw you last. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> yes, quite. Now, while King Charles carves out details of his new roles, the other senior roles are very much back in the day job. And it seems the new Prince and Princess of Wales are busier than ever. They've been in Northern Ireland this week, with meeting and greeting, petting dogs, making cocktails and everything else that could possibly have been asked or expected of them. And then we've also seen the Mark World Mental Health Day, which we know has huge significance to the causes that they represent. Uh, they took over an edition of Radio 1's News Beat programme, a youth news show. And, well, we're not long into this new era for this couple as they find their feet as the Prince and Princess of Wales. And yet we're really seeing them setting out their stall here, aren't we, Russ? Well, I, don't, I think if it, if it ain't broke, you know, don't fix it. They're, they're sort of going on the same track as they uh, as they have um, a well-trodden path. And, you know, we talk about what their future now looks like. Will it change dramatically? I mean, the new, new roles, certainly bigger um, platform, perhaps, arguably. But I think you're obviously going to go back to mental health. It's something that served them very well, and there's something that I th they both feel is a, a life cause, um, but I think you'll see much more of a, a focusing on the on the issues that they've that they set, they set out over the last few years: mental health, children's early development with yeah, Kate, early years. Um, and and maybe I mean I've, I've I've often said it. I think there will be uh, a lot more collaboration between members of the royal family. It's a much more slimmed down version. You've only got a, a few central players, so they'll have to all sort of muck in together. And, and I think this that, lot um, will get on quite well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and why not? The, the yeah. core that we're seeing at the moment. Moment, the King, the Queen, the Waleses, the Wessexes, Wessexes yeah. the Princess Royal, they're kind of, they, they all it. do their own thing, 
but they're all they all seem to be it seems to be sort of a, a, for the first time in a long time they all feel like they're there to sort of support the monarch mm. to support the monarch and kind of I don't know well rather than just together. I think that you know obviously the the, the 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 issue was Harry and Meghan trying to plow their own um, path I suppose but and that was causing quite a lot of discontent within the camp but if they all they all do need to support each other mm. because you, you there's not too many of them so in order to uh, to make it work in order to as um, as I've said earlier uh, to give them a future then they all need to, to try and get along do you think when you sit and listen in for example on the work they did here on the radio and newspeak program talking about mental health do you think we forget sometimes how revolutionary they've been mm. in bringing this conversation to to the public? Well, just on, the, on that, I was reminded, basically, when they did the first ever Heads mm. Together, um, and I was looking into this this week, um, they, they said that no celebrities wanted to be involved at the time. Mm. I can't remember how many yeah. years ago it yeah. was, but yeah. nobody wanted. They all thought it was a bit too taboo, it wasn't going to do well for their careers, and now people are scrambling to talk about it, which is fantastic, but they were the, the real, real yeah. trailblazers. They were very brave. In this, um, in very brave, yeah. And it, was, it wasn't just... Um, the Waleses, we must also acknowledge Harry's contribution mm. at mm. that stage as well. And it was seen as, as really quite groundbreaking. And I think sometimes we forget that they were really pushing new agendas. Mm. In yeah, a way. they were. And I think all, all of them talking about, you know, we had their own struggles with it. We've, you know, we've heard Harry on a couple of podcasts and a couple of documentaries now talking about how, you know, he sought help. We've heard William on the Time to, the Time to Walk podcast and a yeah. couple of football documentaries talking about, you know, when he's gone to dark places, how he's dealt with it. We've heard Kate on a, a, a podcast talking about how she struggled uh, yeah. having, you know, with her babies early yeah, on. Yeah. So all of them have put their money where their mouths are mm. and talked about their own struggles. In order, then they haven't just gone around going, talk about it, talk about it, no. talk about it. They've done it too, and, and, and you know, as they've always said, they wanted to. They've definitely changed the dial on on that conversation. They seem to, do they not? Um, both William and Kate to be very solutions based. So they'll hear a grievance, but they'll try to find. For example, I struggle with my mental health. William will then sit there and say, "Yeah, I did too," and this is the toolbox that I revert to. And then we see Kate here. She is sharing her early years experience. It's a perfect example of of of, of you know them. Going and talking about, you know, she, holding a baby, talking about how, you know, she talked a lot on that, that visit about what Louis was like and, and George and, and all of that. And I think that's really important because then people, the people they're talking to feel they can sort of open up and go, oh, you've been through it too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I think when, when you talk about um, solutions-based, I think one of William's key messages in his mental health work, in his environmental work is there are lots of challenges and difficulties, but there are also solutions. I think he's very, he always talks about being very keen to be optimistic about things rather than it's all gloom and doom. No, Arthur, you, you've been tracking the royal family yeah. for more years than, than I will yeah. care to remember in this moment. Yeah. How is she doing? You've you've Ooh, followed, Kate. yeah, oh, you followed her from, from the get go. Yes, yeah, from when she was the girlfriend. Yeah, she's a star, of course. You know, she's um, and she's grasped it and gone with it and and done her very best. I mean, you can't take a bad picture of it. You know, she she looks like Diana. You can't take a bad picture of it. She's just a star, but she's engrossed in it. But you know, talking about mental health, growing up in East London and after the war, you know. There was no one there to help you. They had to just suck it up and get on with it. And, yeah. and, and you never had anything like that. And in a dark place, you had to work your way through it. Well, and well, I just well wonder, hopefully today I, there's, there is a bit more education. Yeah, on there is. And that's what I'm aware of now because I'm not aware that anxiety is part of mental problems. But I used to always get anxious about things. You know, certainly we started a new job. But I didn't even think that was... But it is. And, I, and, and so they brought it home to me, someone who was totally thinking, like, just, like your mother said, just get over it, you know, get on with it. Uh, and they've made me more aware of it. Obviously, they've got the right message, and, and, and this young lady is, and, and her husband are just doing a, a brilliant job bringing it to the nation. Now, of course, it's not just the Waleses who are out and about. The King, the Queen Consort, the Princess Royal, and the Earl and Duchess of Wessex have all been busy making their royal presence felt, and not just here in Britain, but around the world. Uh, so what have they been up to? Let's start, first and foremost, with arguably uh, one of the hardest working royals, uh, Princess Anne took herself off to New York, and I say took herself off to New York in as much as boarded a regular commercial flight, no real great pomp and ceremony, no photographers. Carried no her own bags. Carried her own bags. A lot of hoo-ha about mean, this, but uh, yeah, fair yeah, play to her. I mean, what was she doing? This was, this was a trip to New York, the first 
visit by a royal to America since Harry and Meghan and the whole and since mix a, it. Obviously mother's passing as well. But yeah. um, again, under the radar, I think she was visiting the Institute of English Language or something. It's, uh, but uh, again, you talk about Princess Anne doing things under the radar. There was absolutely no fanfare. She was there. Um, quick in and out visit. Um, Carol, Four engagements. Yeah. She was guest of honour at a gala dinner for the English speaking That's union. Right. She has a huge passion for light for lighthouses. Yeah. Isn't she, she, the, she the the uh, the patron of the lighthouse? So, uh, it's called the campaign for illuminating illuminating future future future, yeah. illuminating future generations. So she went to see a lighthouse there. Where's the fascination with lighthouses come from, Arthur? Do you know? <laughs> I've no idea, but. Uh, you know, this woman, all her life's been like that. She's totally uh, like the Duke of Edinburgh with, with, the, with the press. She treats them like telegraph poles. She's not interested. <laughs> she, if, you don't, if you don't go on a job, she couldn't care less. I mean, that's her attitude to it. And I remember when she was a, she was a uh, Olympic show jumper, going to the, to the gym, to the law shows and everything. Honestly, she'd give you a mouthful if you felt like you needed it. And I mean, she wasn't, <laughs> she wasn't slow coming forward. So like, I've always been a what, bit nervous about What's the mouthful her. from, from oh, Princess Royal Oh, I'll tell Royal you, I, I can't repeat it on your show, but <laughs> it has been known. But, but, like but before, I love her, you know, yeah. I love her. And she always, when I see her, she always reminds me of the Queen. She speaks like the Queen, she looks like And I just, I think she's just done it right. She didn't want no titles for her children. And I think she was right there, I mean, you know, Zara's closer to the Queen as any of any of uh, Andrew's children or William's children, or uh, and 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 she's just a star, and she's very practical. I mean, when they want, when the, I forget his name now, who was organising the Olympic ceremony, Sabco. Yeah. No, no, the, the producer, Danny Boyle. Danny Boyle had an idea about the Queen jumping out of the helicopter. He went to see Princess Anne. She said, "You know what she said? Go and ask the Queen." You know, normal thing to do if you want to know something, ask someone who can do it. Yeah. And, and, and he did, and it worked. And they, those sort of things is, you never sort of hit realise, but she is very, very, very uh, important part of the family. She's solid, she's got a great husband, never gets involved in politics. He's an admiral, but he's always been just supporting her. And, um, you know, she is a star, but she, she don't like us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a she quite can like her. Yeah, yeah. She can take a leave. She? Unlike yeah. her brother. But I think that's yeah. probably why she has been so incredibly successful in terms of her working, work, the working side of, the, of, you know, her position in the royal family. Because it's never, she has never been driven or motivated by positive or negative press coverage. It's never steered her from her course. And I think there's something a lot to be said for that in terms of a very senior member of the royal family just kind of carving their own path and not really caring how many front pages or you know how many double page spreads or documentaries are made about them. And actually, when, she, when the documentary was made about her a couple of years ago, you know, for her for her 70th birthday, she was, I mean, there was she was so funny in that. She was, she was so, wasn't she? she was so sort of reluctant, but in every interview, because and her children yeah. really spoke so beautifully about her in a way that was entirely relatable. So, yeah, I think, you know, as much as she may not court the attention, that when, when the spotlight does fall on her, we all kind of fall under her spell slightly, don't we? Okay. Um, talking of hidden stars within the royal family, um, Sophie Wessex, I mean, we're really seeing her step up now. She became the first member of the royal family um, to travel to the Democratic Republic of Congo and did some really very difficult work there. The trip had a focus on survivors of sexual violence in conflict. Difficult work to navigate, and yet the family seemed to trust her to do that. She's brilliant. She's absolutely brilliant. Brilliant, Sophie. I and mean, I've been to the DRC. It is not an easy country to get to or travel around. It's quite hairy security-wise. Um, but you know, she she went there and did all this incredibly important work highlighting, you know, um, the impact of, of of sexual violence and conflict. That's something she's been doing for a long mm. time. There's a lot of discussion around Sophie. We are suddenly seeing the Wessexes come to the fore. It, it, we're paying them more attention. She's doing yeah. the same work she's been doing Interesting. for years. You know, a lot of work with um, uh, sexual uh, uh, violence and conflict, a lot of work with the prevention of blindness. But she has been doing these things for sort of 10 years or more. It's just that you know, now in this streamlined monarchy, there are less people around. She's getting more of a platform. And I think the palace are definitely pushing it because 
she's a good news story for the royal family. Would you agree with that? Because well, it's so you know, she's that. being elevated. She is, be, she is being elevated in, in our minds, and that's mainly because we've got less people to focus yeah. on. Um, and, and as Roy rightly says, she's been doing this across Africa for many, many years. However, I don't know necessarily think that the palace are pushing it. I mean, you look at these, this trip, and, and she was in Rwanda later on, uh, a few days later. Yes. The, she didn't take any journalists with her. She's a, and you talk about Princess Anne, you know, um, doing things under the radar, not really making a fuss, not doing it for her own gain almost. And Sophie is taking a leaf out of that book. But they're she took a photographer from the PA, mm. and nobody yeah, but used again, the pictures. And nobody used the like pictures. Tours, are they? The problem is, they, Russell, they could nobody uses the pictures. Why is yeah. that then? I don't know because I don't know why. But, well, you know, the, the, the but issue I is like, because like we're not being Royal. invited, and so well, if, they're, if they're not making, a, and I think that they could do. I think there's a great opportunity. Did you know about it beforehand? No. No, I didn't. But know. if you'd known yeah. about it beforehand, oh, we wasn't we told. Gone. We yeah. would have, we were probably gone, but we wasn't invited because for some reason she doesn't publish, nor does that, nor does Edward. And I don't and I've never understood it because like you said, well, like Roy said, but the argument is she that, is I think. such a wonderful person. Well we did a massive piece on her last year. Christina Lamb, mm. our main like, amazing foreign correspondent went with her to Sierra Leone and did an enormous piece in the Sunday Times magazine. It was the cover piece about her work. So she, she, she does, but not not to the extent... Those, I've seen one picture in the Telegraph, I think, of her but on the, the issue, trip. The issue is because they haven't uh, invited the journalists, and I think that it's a perfect marriage. You get pictures you know, of her. You need the content Princess well. Anne never invited you either. You didn't even know about that. I don't think that people no. identify with Princess Anne as much as they would I tell do you what, Sophie that, Wessex. Yeah, I agree with you. She's a, young, be... she's a younger, more glamorous woman. And she's taking on, um, you know, pretty bold subjects like like sexual violence amongst women, and and she's she's ready to speak about it as well. And I think there there is a gap in the market, so to speak, for her to come to the fore. But I, I think it's a real shame. And I've, you know, we've argued this with the palaces ourselves. We've covered um, Sophie extensively, and I do think I think people are, especially in my organisation, people who read the Daily Mirror, are really interested. Oh, we're becoming far more interested. It's so interesting mm. that I like I love this observation that actually she's doing no more or less. Then she no, she's not. She no. We're just paying yeah. better yeah. attention. Yeah. She, she said that she travels to India for, yeah. for her eyes for people with poor eyes. I mean, she's she's an amazing woman, but if they don't get the publicity, and and, mm. and it's because we don't go with that, and that's the reason, and we should because we were too obsessed with Kate and William and Harry and Meghan, and we don't. It seems to be no time for this woman, but now, please God, we will, and uh, and give her some what she's due, which is sort of acknowledgement mm. of the work, great work she's not doing now, but what she's done, done in the past. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Now, anyone who is a follower of Royal News can't have missed the story that's been unfolding in Denmark. Two weeks ago, Queen Margrethe, who has sat on the Danish throne for 50 years, announced a decision that the children of her younger son would no longer be known as Princess and princesses as of January 2023. Now, the sudden question is <clears throat> Prince Joachim, uh, who responded publicly to the decision, saying that his children were very hurt and they hadn't been given the adequate notice to break the news to them. Uh, while he and his mother have now apparently entered into um, seemingly more constructive discussions, Joachim's relationship with his brother, the heir to the throne, Crown Prince Frederick, is still being described as, quote, complicated sound familiar uh, before we start to unpick all of this can can you guys just lay the land uh, the lie of the land for me the danish royal family this this is this this queen queen margareta is quite formidable very close friends with our late queen um, and well you you take it from here well what do we need to know about this family and why is it crumbling well, it's 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 she she was a very close friend and a distant relative, I think, of of the late queen. They were they were very close, distant and, cousins. Yeah, yeah, she she used to call her Lilibet and talk very fondly about her. And I think there was something about the fact that they were these two quite elderly female monarchs, quite rare, uh, uh, that that they had a very strong bond. But it, like you say, it does sound quite familiar. It, it, that I think Queen Margaret's decision to remove these titles comes from a desire, as she has said, to try and modernise, modernise, but also give her, some of her grandchildren, who are not going to be front and centre of the Danish royal family, the freedom and ability to forge their own lives and their own careers without the constraints of titles. And you know, we have. Yeah, she says that she wants them to have. Uh, to, to shape their own lives to a much greater extent without being limited by the special considerations and obligations that formal belonging to the royal house as an institution entails. So on the one hand, she's trying to say, 
go off, forge your own lives, and don't always have this sort of noose around your neck where people will come at you and go, you're, you're, you're making money and you're, you're, you're trading off your old connections. That's what she's saying. I hope it's a little bit easier for you and freeing for you. Their reaction is, do you know what? We're, we're kind of already forging our own lives. Um, you know, we've got we've got our own careers. Why are you taking this away from us so suddenly now at this juncture? So it's not had the reaction she was expecting, and I think it has bred, well, by the sounds of it, and by the interviews that that you know members of this family have given, it's bred an awful lot of ill feeling between them, the Queen, and also you know the, the Crown Prince Frederick, who yeah. you, who you would imagine was probably consulted on this decision, given that he is the heir and he's a sort of future stakeholder. In the same way, you would expect Charles to consult yes. William. Uh, oh, yeah, yes. we know that Charles consulted William on all the discussions about Harry. Uh, you know Harry and Meghan's departure because he was involved in all those conversations. The, the same with Prince Andrew. Reports have suggested that the news was delivered to. Um, Joachim uh, via an aide rather than the Queen speaking to him herself directly. Surely if that's the case that would not have helped things would it? No but that's you know so often that's the way our royal family here communicate with each other. They communicate very often via their private secretaries. I think that's where a lot of problems uh, uh, turn up because you know a lot of people will tell you in the households that instead of picking up the phone to each other they very often communicate particularly difficult messages via aides. And that tends not to go down well, particularly if, you know, Queen Margrethe was going to strip her grandchildren of their titles. That's the kind of thing you would probably have hoped she had heard from the horse's mouth. She actually issued a second, second statement uh, in response to her son's very public um, declaration of, well, I mean, that he's unhappy about. Furious. Yeah, furious. furious yeah. yeah. She said, it's my duty and my wish as Queen to ensure that the monarchy continues to shape itself in keeping with the times. It sometimes requires difficult decisions to be made. I've made my decision as a Queen, mother and grandmother, but as a mother and grandmother, I've underestimated how much my youngest son and his family feel affected. This is a big statement, isn't it? Well, it is, and obviously the parallels are there to be seen with our own royal family. But again, it seems like you know, this half-in, half-out model that was widely discussed with uh, with Harry and Meghan. I don't see how it can work. I mean, as Roy says, that the, the children have all intents and purposes said, "Well, we are making our own way in the world." They're, you know, in, they're modelling. They're modelling. They're doing they're not things remote. in big cities. Well, there you go. They're definitely uh, um, making their, their own mark, aren't they? But. Surely, it, 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 you, can't, you can't have that. You can't, you know, why, why is he on the cover of Vogue? It's because he's a member of the royal family. And, and if they are saying that we're, we're uh, setting our own path, then that's only because you're trading on, on your royal even, life. He doesn't so. even live in, in Denmark. Well, exactly, yeah. He lives in Paris. Yes. He's living, yeah. he living, yeah. living the high life. I, yeah. mean, I, I, think, I mean, I never even heard of him before this, come, mm. this story came out. He was, he was never exactly put his back into it. I've done royal tours <laughs> exactly, to Denmark. Yeah, yeah. I've done <laughs> royal tours him. to Denmark with, 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 with Prince, uh, when he was Prince of Wales, and, and with William and Catherine, and I've never come across him. So, you know, obviously, Frederick and Mary, lots of times yeah. recently we went there okay, when Catherine went, Catherine, and, yeah. and, it, and Mary and, 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 and Catherine were together all the time and I mean but I never saw him well it sounds once. rather petulant doesn't it and then again we're talking about Harry and Meghan that um, throwing toys out the pram by saying well why can't we have it all it's all, all sounds rather familiar doesn't do you it? think Actually, that this right. is a bit of a that's my picture that is it yeah ah yeah do you think that this is something of a trend that we're going to start to see ripple through the royal households? Is you know their attempt to modernise and keep uh, you know keep a pace with the people. Well, it's already happening throughout Europe, and I think you're seeing again. We spoke about earlier about modern monarchies, streamlining versions of themselves in a modern world. What does it mean to be? Um, are they relevant? And in order to, to survive, you've got to stay relevant. So people don't want to see a big crowd. Look at the balcony scene that we've seen over the last couple of years. People don't want to see hordes of, hordes of them up there. They want to see you know, a very streamlined version of this, uh, of this institution working for the greater good, not just um, you know, feathering their own nests, I we've suppose. We've got the issue here as well, brewing, here and across the pond, because... Say, mm. This is my next question, where, well, now what? I've written about this. I wrote about this the other day in the Sunday Times. You know, on the death of the Queen, Harry's children, Archie and Lilibet, automatically as grandchildren of the sovereign became HRH and prince and princess. So they've got that now. But they have not been updated on the royal website with their new titles. They are still m m master, master and miss. Well, you know, William and Kate's new titles were instantly updated. And it's my understanding that this was discussed between father and son when Harry was over here and he said, what do you want, son? And he said, well, 
I'd like my children to be able to decide about their titles when they come of age. It's not my decision to make them. We can only do that if we keep the titles. Now, they have the titles now, but it's up to Charles whether or not he allows them to, to, to keep them or whether he issues letters patent to remove them. And that is still unresolved. And I, I Why do you think that is? Is that because we're waiting to see what Harry's book's going to say? I think, I think Charles will be waiting to see a lot of things. I think he'll probably wait to see how Denmark plays out. He's going to think about... Denmark is a very interesting case he's, in point he's for him, He's going to think it? about how the, the future of the monarchy looks like. William, you know, uh, Harry and Meghan have chosen their own path in, in America. Should that affect their children's future lives? Some, some would argue yes, some would argue no. You know, there's all sorts of issues over it. But I think... Watch this space, because when that decision is finally made, and my understanding is that, that the king is still considering what he's going to do there, if he decides to issue letters patent and remove those titles, I think you can bet your bottom dollar that is not going to go down well in California. <laughs> Hope he yeah. does. Hope and, does. And other understatements. Uh, for now, though, that's all we've got time for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, as always, to my wonderful guests, to Arthur, to Roya, to Russ. We'll be back in a fortnight. And until then, remember, the conversation remains open 24-7 on our social media channels. Thanks for watching. Don't forget, you can watch the latest episode of The Royal Beat at trueroyalty.tv.